Section 12 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Part 3 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Supply and Distribution In the confusion and disorder of the first few days of the fire, the only one practicable rule, and that one of imperative necessity, was that the hungry should be fed. The bountiful supplies which began to pour in from all parts of the country, while the fire was still burning, fortunately made it possible to give food to all who asked for it. Churches and school buildings were used as depots and distributing offices, and all who asked received, with such order and economy as it was possible to establish in so sudden an emergency. Discrimination, however, was impossible, and bounty fell upon the deserving and the undeserving, as certainly as that the rain falls upon the just and the unjust. For in a calamity that was so universal, and where tens of thousands were faint for want of bread, there was neither the leisure nor the disposition for careful scrutiny. Some waste was inevitable, but it was of more consequence that none should suffer from want, than that a few who were not in need should not become successful impostors. But to reduce the work of relief to a system, for the sake of economy in the ways and means, to secure to the real sufferers the needed aid, to detect and defeat imposition, to aid in establishing order by withholding encouragement to idleness, was, after giving food to all who said they were hungry, the first object of the committee. The task was immense, for an army of a hundred thousand, not of men only, with some power of endurance, but of men, women, and children, with their aged, their sick, their helpless, and their infirm, was suddenly thrown upon the hands of the society, and there was neither commissariat, nor organization, nor cohesion, nor even distinct and separate locality to fall back upon. The first step was to district the city, under the direction of O. C. Gibbs, who for years had been superintendent of the Relief and Aid Society, and it was accordingly divided into five large districts, made as nearly equal as possible with regard to population. These were subdivided, at first, into thirteen smaller sub-districts, but which are now, as rearranged from time to time, and as rations are given out at longer intervals, six only. The whole are under the general superintendent, but to each district is given a superintendent with supervision over his whole district, and to each sub-district a sub-superintendent with supervision over his immediate depot of supplies. Sufficient assistance is given to each superintendent, averaging about ninety men and women to each district, the duties of a part of whom are to administer to the wants of applicants for food and clothing, courteously and kindly, but with a firm adherence to the rules established to guard against extravagant or injudicious distribution, the duplication of relief or pretended want. Another part of this force is made up of a corps of visitors who are constantly busy in visiting all whose names are registered in the books at the offices of the relief stations, and in searching for sufferers who need aid but do not know where to find it. Registration was resorted to at the outset, both as an act of mercy and as a measure of precaution, and a rule was established at the earliest practicable moment, by which none were allowed to take supplies from the depots without full entry of name, residence, condition, and other circumstances which would identify the applicant. It is the business of the visitor to keep himself constantly informed as to all the persons who are thus entered in his district, and to make periodical returns at the office. He is to learn by observation and inquiry the exact condition of the registered, whether they are well or ill, whether they are idle or industrious, whether they are voluntarily idle, in which case they are peremptorily cut off from aid, whether they are entitled to entire or only partial support, whether they have other means of support than public bounty, and in short any circumstances in relation to their condition or habits or character, 
which will be a guide as to the care which should be given them at the stations. There a ledger account is opened with each of them, in which appear the returns of the visitors, the supplies given, with their dates, and when they were cut off if discontinued, and the reasons why. The superintendents are required to keep a strict account of all their requisitions of supplies, as well as of their distribution, and as they are accountable for a judicious and energetic discharge of their duties to the general superintendent, so they hold their own subordinates strictly accountable for all their actions. Full and careful reports are made daily from each district, and the superintendents meet one evening in the week with the executive committee to make or hear suggestions, to answer criticism or complaints, to report progress, and suggest improvement, if possible, in the working machinery. The districts are frequently visited by a general inspector to examine into their condition and management, and a committee on complaints is always ready at headquarters to listen to any complaints of neglect or improper treatment, and to provide for their immediate correction, if found on inquiry to be well founded. It has taken a good deal of time to bring into systematic condition a complicated business of this sort, which was, in fact, getting in running order under every possible disadvantage of want of preparation, as many large commercial establishments as there are warehouses, bureaus, and relief stations at the various points. But on the whole the committee believe that no better plan than that which they have adopted can be devised to carry on the work in their hands, wisely, economically, effectively, and humanely, that the relief given injudiciously or unnecessarily will be reduced to the smallest possible percentage, while none are deprived of it who are justly entitled to it. In addition to the several districts of the city proper, there is a sixth district which includes all that portion of Cook County outside the city limits, which is under precisely the same rules and regulations with the rest, and has a similar supervision for such of the sufferers by the fire as may have found refuge in the other towns in the county. The subjoined table is a summary of the statements made by the superintendents of the six districts for the weeks ending November 18th and 25th. By them will be seen the number of families in need of aid at those dates, and the fluctuations that have taken place in the course of the two weeks. Note. At this point in the text there is introduced a table, entitled Statement of Families Aided. Here will be read only the totals from this table, but let it be noted that the table includes a breakdown of all these figures for each of the six districts. End of note. Statement of Families Aided. Totals. Number of families reported receiving aid November 11th, 12,765. Number added from November 11th to November 18th, 2,105. Number discontinued from November 11th to November 18th, 733. Number of families receiving aid on November 18th, 14,137. The number of families added during the week between November 18th and 25th, 2,471. The number of families to whom aid was discontinued during that week, 1,486. Leaving the number of families receiving aid on November 25th, 15,122. The number of families aided from the time the records were complete to November 11th, was 18,478. Of these, 2,470 asked only for stove, bedding, and clothing. The other 16,000 required food, as well as other necessaries. It will be observed that from November 11th to November 18th, there was an increase of 1,372 families, and from November 18th to November 25th, an increase of 985. This is owing, doubtless, to the increasing severity of the weather, 
and is a fair indication of what may be expected for months to come, as the cold becomes more intense and the demand for labor decreases. As a large part of the business portion of Chicago was destroyed by the fire, hundreds of families are destitute whose homes were not consumed, but who drew their support from occupation in the shops and manufactories of various sorts. RATIONS Food was given at first not only indiscriminately, but in uncertain quantities, for want of conveniences in measuring and weighing. As soon as possible, however, it was reduced to fixed rations, and as the system of distribution was perfected, they were given out at intervals of two or three days, and now of a week. The following ration, for a family of five persons, has been found to be sufficient for one week. At first bread was given instead of flour, as the people had few conveniences for cooking, at an increased cost of forty-two cents to the ration. This is now almost wholly saved, as most of the applicants are supplied with stoves, and can bake their own bread. Crackers for the first few days were substituted for bread where the supply of bread was insufficient. All the crackers used, however, were contributions from abroad. Coffee or tea is given, as the applicant prefers, but tea, which is the cheaper, is the more usually chosen. The cost of the ordinary weekly ration given for a family of five is one dollar and ninety-eight cents, as shown by the following exhibit. Exhibit of the amount and cost of one week's rations for two adults and three children. Three pounds pork at five and a half cents, sixteen and a half cents. Six pounds beef at five cents, thirty cents. Fourteen pounds flour at three cents, forty-two cents. One and a quarter peck potatoes at twenty cents, twenty-five cents. A quarter pound tea at eighty cents, twenty cents. One and a half pounds sugar at eleven cents, sixteen and a half cents. One and a quarter pound rice at eight cents, or three and a half pounds beans at three and three quarter cents, twelve cents. One and a quarter pound soap at seven cents, nine cents. One and a half pound dried apples at eight cents, twelve cents. Three pound fresh beef at five cents, fifteen cents. Total, one dollar and ninety-eight cents. If bread, at four cents per pound, is used instead of flour, the cost is increased forty-two cents. If crackers, at seven cents per pound, one dollar and five cents. If one and a half pounds coffee, instead of tea, seventeen cents. To the cost of the weekly ration of food for a family of five should be added the allowance of one ton of coal a month, or a quarter of a ton a week. Fortunately for such an exigency as this, the supply of bituminous coal for Chicago is ample, through the Wilmington Coal Company, which owns and works extensive coal mines in Will County, Illinois, with sufficient means of transportation at their command over the Alton, St. Louis, and Chicago road. With this company the committee has made a contract for the delivery of coal by the ton or half ton at the door for four dollars and fifty cents per ton this brings the weekly cost of coal for the family at one dollar twelve and a half cents which added to the cost of the weekly ration brings the cost of food and fuel at three dollars ten and a half cents as the demand for fuel is as constant and next in importance to that of food a large depot of coal from other sources is kept in reserve for emergencies, as in case of interruption to railroad transportation by snowstorms or other causes during the winter. Clothing The demand for clothing has been and continues to be incessant and immense. The larger proportion of those who were sufferers by the fire lost all their personal apparel and their household goods. Immediate and urgent need was only very partially met by the bountiful supplies which were sent forward from all quarters. 
Much of this supply was of second-hand summer clothing, which was all that people could lay their hands on in the first emergency. It answered a good, though only a temporary, purpose, and the necessity of substituting for it better and warmer garments is constant and imperative. The markets of this country cannot supply the demand for blankets alone. Where the supply of ready-made clothing has been insufficient, peace goods are given out in measured quantity to applicants to make up for themselves. In this work great assistance is rendered by associations of ladies, as the Ladies' Relief and Aid Society, the Ladies' Industrial Aid Society of St. John's Church, the Ladies' Christian Union, Ladies' Society of Park Avenue Church, and Ladies' Society of the Home of the Friendless, all of whom employ a large number of sewing women, thrown out of employment by the fire, in making up garments, bed comforters, bed ticks, and other articles, from peace goods supplied by the Relief Committee, and returned, thus manufactured, to the several depots for distribution. But a comparatively small portion of those in need of warm and sufficient clothing for the winter is as yet supplied, and the labor and expenditure to meet this want must be very large for some time to come. Of the actual quantity received by gift from abroad and distributed, it is impossible to make a detailed statement, as much of that received was given out in the first calamitous days of destitution to all comers and without count. The United States government, through the active efforts of General Sheridan, has furnished us 7,000 blankets, and has also on the way for our use 5,000 each of undershirts, drawers, and socks. We are promised by President Grant, through the Honorable W. W. Belknap, Secretary of War, who has recently visited Chicago, such further supplies as we may need, so far as the government may have them in store. This branch of the work, however, is being reduced to a system like the rest, and the following table is condensed from the reports of the several districts for the week ending November 25th, giving the number distributed of several articles of prime necessity, to it is added the number previously reported since an accurate record was kept. Note. Here is appended in the text a table entitled Distribution of Articles for the Week Ending November 25th. Here will be read only the totals, but let it be noted that the chart includes a breakdown of all these figures for each of the six districts. End of note distribution of articles for the week ending November 25th. Totals. Mattresses, 10,737. Blankets, 25,339. Tons of coal, 4,653. Stoves, 4,459. Shoes, 22,581. Men's wear, 54,729. Women's wear, 65,986. Children's wear, 44,937. The above table does not include the stoves and mattresses given out by the shelter committee, who furnished both articles to the large proportion of their houses and the barracks. Neither does it include the furniture and crockery, both large items of expenditure, the aggregate of which is not yet reached. End of section 12